We want to give a huge welcome to all the virtual members of Columbine United Church. A happy first Sunday of Advent. It's great to have you here. You know, I know that some of you are checking in with us this afternoon because uh, you decided to take a Sunday off, but you still want to catch up. It's good to have you. As well as those of you who are across the United States, a couple of you on the other side of the pond, especially our men and women in uniform, it is great to have you. Let's give these folks a warm Columbine welcome. Very good. Now, our scripture passage is a very short passage, just uh, two verses, and you better have known these passages. You should, if you don't know these, shame, shame, shame on you. You need to come to church more often. The scripture passage is, while they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. You've heard this one before, right? Yeah, very good. And the passage ends there. May God bless these words that we seek to apply them to our lives. The gift for a baby. The gift for a baby. The first Sunday of Advent. First Sunday of Advent. Before we jump into the first Sunday of Advent, it's been a busy week here at Columbine. Those of you who haven't kind of known it, what's been going on, a week from, uh, from today, last week, we... Um, we uh, installed Jane Ritterson as our associate pastor, and that was a great celebration. We had all the members of the Presbytery here. Yeah, she's not here. She slipped out to make a pastoral call here, and that's why she's not here. And then Thanksgiving Day, I hope you all had a great Thanksgiving celebration. Uh, we were over at um, my son Kyle and his, his bride Rachel's house. It was the first time they had ever hosted a Thanksgiving dinner at their house. So it was a lot of fun. Thanksgiving, as far as, I mean, there was 13 people there. So the first time they've ever did a, did a dinner of this size. And they had the table all set up. And Kyle had smoked the turkey. It wasn't dried out. It was perfect. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. So we had a big, a big Sunday. Uh, Big Thursday. The other thing that happened that uh, many people have been asking about is that my mother had a severe fall. She fell and she broke her hip and people have been asking about how she's doing. Well, she's in rehab now. Um, And those of you who know that if you've been in rehab, it's not all a party. Uh, She refers to it as her physical terrorist. And she... (laughs) And she called it Fifty Shades of Black. Fifty Shades of Black. Uh, she is not enjoying it, but the cool thing is every day she's a little bit stronger, a little bit better. She'll be in there for a couple of weeks, so your prayers, and I'll keep you posted on things are going. But then today is the first Sunday of Advent. I mean to tell you, I love the season of Advent. You know, it begins the whole season of Christmas, and I want to make sure that you are getting into the Christmas spirit. You know, I began this past weekend. I mean, I am ready to go. I'm ready for a great month. You know, I've already put the Christmas lights up on on the house, I didn't curse, well, okay, I cursed once. <laughs> I cursed once. I mean, I put the lights up, I put the lights up, and then half the lights didn't work, you know, and I began to wonder, like, how does this happen? I mean, last year, I, I wrap them up, and I put them away like they're China, you know, and I, you know, I want them to be, you know, preserved, and you come out, and half of them don't work. What's with that? I didn't curse I didn't curse. I didn't curse when I had to go to Lowe's, Home Depot, and Costco, you know, to find the lights that match. Got a whole new set of lights, put them up. I didn't curse. I cursed when I went to plug them in, and I had the wrong power in at the end. <laughs> See, you've been there. You've been there. But it was a divine curse. It was a holy curse. I didn't take them all down and put them back up. Man, are you in the mood? Are you getting in the mood for, I just love getting in, you know, and the season of Advent, you know, this is such a great time, you know, this whole journey of Advent where we, where we go from the first Sunday of Advent to, to, the, uh, to Christmas Eve, this great journey, and the theme for this coming uh, season of Advent, we're calling the gift, because Mitch, who's somewhere, wrote the Christmas pageant this year, and it's called The Gift. So what we've decided to do is to build a sermon series around it. And I'm going to start by talking about the baby Jesus today. Um, and then uh, next Sunday, Jane is going to preach about the gift of the baby Jesus, you know, from the uh, perspective of Mary. Third sand- Sunday of Advent, we're going to have the Christmas pageant, again, that Mitch is writing. The fourth Sunday of Ad- Advent, Justin's going to be preaching about the gift from just average people like the shepherd. But I want to talk today about the baby Jesus. And, and what a gift the baby Jesus was. You know, when we never really think about baby Jesus as being just a human being. We think about him being, you know, Christ, fully human, fully divine. We think about angels. We think about a star. We think about a magi. And that's 
that's Christmas Eve. On Christmas Eve, we think about that. On this, fourth, on this first Sunday of Advent, we think about him being just a baby child. And I think it's important to think about that we, it's amazing that this baby child even survived. In the Roman Empire, the mortality rate among babies was one in eight. Was one in eight. A mother had to become pregnant eight times for one child to live. You know, and it's amazing that Mary even survived. And we think about Mary being kind of a, a young woman some, somewhere in her 20s. Well, that wasn't the case. Um, in the, in the, this ancient civilization, throughout the Roman Empire, uh, women prearranged marriages were married at the age of 12, and they started bearing children at the age of 15. And the death rate among uh, women, they died usually between the ages of 15 and 29. So if you think about the fact that every time that one of these women became uh, pregnant, that raised their, uh, their, their chances of dying, giving birth, was a dangerous adventure for, for women. And to prevent, pre prevent the, the death of women and, and raise the, the hope of children being born alive, there were midwives. And in the Roman Empire, for every birth, there was uh, three midwives that attended a birth. And you have to ask yourself, it's not told in the story, but were there midwives that helped Mary give birth? It cost money to have a midwife. Were Mary and Joseph able to afford a midwife? Three midwives? Two midwives? One? Or you think about the fact that this 15-year-old young girl give birth to the baby Jesus by herself, just attended by Joseph in a barn, in a cave, does she give birth to this baby by herself? And you know, we say that we have this romantic image that, that they wrap the baby in swaddling clothes. Well, it, it was the custom in, in this ancient civilization that when a baby was born, the first thing they did is they rubbed them with salt. They rubbed the baby with salt and they poured olive oil in the eyes, thinking that the olive oil would protect the eyes. And then they wrapped them in swaddling clothes. And, and if you were a wealthy person, the swaddling clothes was this beautiful beautiful piece of linen, but we know that they were dirt poor. So where did those swaddling clothes come from? Was it an undergarment? Was it something they took off the, the donkey? Was it something they found in the barn? Some type of rough burlap? But it's amazing that this baby survived at all. And we think about, you know, that Mary and jo Joseph, I think when the baby Jesus was born, they didn't think about the fact that this was the Christ child. I think like any other parent, they were grateful that this baby was just alive. And don't you remember those of you who, uh, when your, your kid was born and they handed you the kid, I'll never forget when the kid, when they handed you know, Kyle to me for the very, term, very first time, I thought to myself, don't, I'm gonna drop it. You know, and then you know, when he took his first breath, there was a sense of <gasps> relief because you know, the baby, Kyle started crying. Do you think that happened with Mary and Joseph? When that baby was born, there was just a sense of relief. And they held the baby for the first time. Don't you remember that? And you just counted, you know, ten fingers, ten toes. And you're just grateful that this baby was alive. I have to think that Mary and Joseph felt the same way. And that's what the first Sunday of Advent is all about. It's just thinking about this baby that was born. You know, on, on the fourth Sunday of Advent, we think about, and Christmas Eve, we think about the Christ child. We think about fully human and fully divine. But on this first Sunday of Advent, we think about he was just a baby. And so then given the theme of the, of the gift, what is the gift that we're going to bring to this baby? What is it that we're going to bring to this young infant baby Jesus? And I was thinking about it, I think the greatest gift that we can bring to Jesus is ourselves, is the gift of ourselves. But when I think about the gift of ourselves, I don't think about the broken part of ourselves. You know, we, we often think about our humanity, we think about a broken humanity, we think about our sin, we think about our pain, we think about our shortcomings. You know, and, and surely all these things are welcome in Bethlehem, they're welcome to the manger, but when I think about our humanity and I think about the gift I want to bring to the baby Jesus, I think about our divinity. You know, I believe that we are divine beings. I believe that we are chips off the old divine block. 
and that, and that divinity dwells within us. And one of the greatest callings that we have as human beings is to bring that divinity out of ourselves until it's fully realized in the world. And if we're going to talk about a gift that we want to bring to the Christ child, I want, to think, want you to think about your divinity. And during the season of Advent, I want you to think about the fact that you are indeed divine beings. And I want you to use the season of Advent to bring that divinity to wholeness. And I want you to think about the fact that you have the Holy Spirit of God flowing in you and through you. And this gift of the Holy Spirit brings gifts to your life. And the Holy Spirit animates those gifts and brings them out into the world. And the gifts are God's gift to you, and what you do with those gifts are God's gift back, or are your gifts back to God. And I want you to think about what are your gifts? You know, I really believe that everybody has about 10 spiritual gifts that God has given to you. And I want you to think, can you name the 10 things that you do better than anybody else on the planet? The 10 things that you do better than anybody else on the planet. You might think, I don't do that. Well, yeah, you do, because you're the only one who has these gifts. You make them unique. And are you using these gifts to, to their fruition? Well, maybe during the season of Advent, it's time to be creative. It's time to really use your gifts. It's time to take your gifts to the next level. You know, and, and I want you, Mitch always talks about the fact that we need to be creative. And if you're creative, then create. If you're a writer, then write. If you're a musician, then play. If you sing, then sing. If you're an architect, then, then draw. If you're an engineer, then design. What is it that you do that has unique gifts that you need to bring to the world? You know, I made a dedication to myself, a commitment to myself, because I love to write. I used to consider myself a writer. Um, but I put that on the back burner for several months because life just kind of got in the way. And, but I made a decision that during the season of Advent, I'm going to set aside an hour every single day to write. Even if I have to stare at a blank computer screen for an hour, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to get my fingers going until I decide to write something, until something starts emerging. I've decided that I'm going to return to my music. I love playing instruments. Uh, I have a guitar that I play, I have a banjo that I play, I have a violin, I inherited my grandfather's violin. And, but life has gotten in the way, life has gotten in the way, and I haven't had the chance to play. So I made a commitment that during Advent, I'm going to play for at least an hour. I'm going to write for an hour in the morning, I'm going to play instruments for an hour in the evening. And I made a commitment, I started, I started the other night, and I started playing the violin. I started playing the violin until my son uh, uh, Taylor yelled out from the other room, Whatever you're killing in there, could you please stop? <laughs> what are you going to do? This beautiful, holy month, what are you going to do? You know, for me, when I think about Advent, I think about this time to be creative. How can you be creative? You know, when I think about Advent, I think about the fact that we are children of God. And if we want to talk about a gift that we want to bring to the baby, I want us to think about the fact that we're going to bring to the, fact, bring to the baby that we are children as well. We are children of God. And then, you know, just as baby Jesus was a child of God, so are we children of God. Just as the baby Jesus was loved and accepted by God, so are we loved and accepted by God. And I want you to think about Advent, what it means to be a child of God. I want to think about, look at what we do for children during Advent. Look at how we lavish them with these wonderful things during Advent leading up to Christmas. We want everybody to kind of get into the Christmas spirit. We want to teach our kids what it means to get into the Christmas spirit. And so we go to their parties. They come to our parties. They get to decorate the house. They get to decorate the tree. You know, we decorate cookies with them. We, we take them shopping with us. We, we have them make Christmas lists for us, not of what they need, but what they want. And we want to lavish these beautiful things upon our kids because we want them to have memories. We want them to find the joy and the love of Advent in the Christmas season. What if we said that same thing about God in us? What if we were to see that God wants to lavish upon us that same type of feeling, that same type of joy, that same type of happiness? 
Do you feel that sense of lavishness that, that God wants? I mean, just think about all the beautiful things that God surrounds us with. You know, just think about all these beautiful bows. Do you know that a bow is the color of red during Christmas because it's the color of the heart? It's the color of passion? It's the color of light? And that's why we use red bows. So every single Sunday that you come here, you're reminded of this. And I want to ask you something. I want you to make a commitment to come to church every single Sunday of Advent for the next four weeks. I want you to come every single Sunday because I want you to be reminded of the heart and the life of Christmas and the joy of Christmas and the beauty of Christmas. I mean, there's red bows, there's wreaths, there's lights, there's Christmas tree. You know, there's the beautiful starry nights that are out right now. I know a lot of people are like, oh gosh, it gets dark so early these days. Well, maybe you get to see that this is a beautiful thing that, that it gets dark early. Because now you can light candles, you can have lights. And I want you to put up lights in your house. Put up lights on the outside of your house to, to experience the beauty of it. If you don't want to put out lights on the outside of your house, then find some place to put lights up on the inside of your house. So when it gets dark early, you can turn on these lights and just celebrate the joy of lights. I know that some of you, kind of the older that you get, you say, I'm not going to put up a Christmas tree anymore. I just don't want to put up a Christmas tree. Well, I want to tell you, no, this year, put up a Christmas tree. Even if you've got to go buy one. This afternoon, I'm going to meet the kids and we're going to go cut down a Christmas tree. We're going to kind of get into it and decorate a Christmas tree. Because Christmas trees are beautiful. You know, get out and drive around and look at the lights. Go out to the Chatfield Arboretum. If you haven't been to the Chatfield Ar Ar Arboretum right down here off Wadsworth and Chatfield or Wadsworth and Deer Creek Canyon, it is alive with lights. You know, it reminds us that God wants to lavish upon us the beauty of Advent and the beauty of the Christmas season. You know, I want the season of Advent for you to, to celebrate what it means to be a child of God. You know, I, I first found this commitment to being a child of God when I felt as though that the only thing that Christians emphasized was sin and brokenness. And that's thought to myself, really? Is that where we want to start? What if we started with the whole idea that we are loved children of God? And during Advent, during Advent, as you light candles and look at the starry night, Look at the Christmas lights. You can be reminded that you are a beloved child of God. And during Advent, we want you to be committed to peace on earth. We, we lit the peace candle this morning to creating peace on earth. And that is one of the most significant aspects of Advent is that we celebrate the Prince of Peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called children, children of God. And one of the greatest commitments we have during Advent is to create peace on earth. And when we think about peace on earth, you know, we think about things like ISIS and Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, Aleppo, and we think, how can we bring peace out there? You know, it seems so far beyond us. Well, maybe what we need to think about is the way that we bring peace on earth is to find peace inside of ourselves. That's where we begin. That's where we begin. And what if we dedicated ourselves during Advent to bringing peace on earth in the middle of our own lives? And what if we declared a moratorium? What if we climbed a Geneva Accords? What if we negotiated a, a peace truth in our own, peace truce in our own lives? What if for the four weeks of Advent, we said, we're not gonna fight we're going to broker a peace. I'm not going to fight with my ex. I'm not going to fight with my spouse. I'm not going to fight with my partner. You know, I'm not going to fight with my boss. I'm not going to fight with my coworkers. I'm going to negotiate some kind of peace treaty with my kids, with my teenagers. I'm not going to fight with them. I'm not going to take the bait that someone sets in front of us, because that's what happens. Someone sets the bait, they push our button, and we feel something seize inside of us, and we feel ourselves getting tense, and we get defensive, and we think what comes to our mind is, how dare they say that or do that to me? Well, during the month of Advent, you're going to learn how to take a break. 
and you can learn how to breathe. And you can be reminded of the fact that, that we are people of peace. And we're going to practice peace during Advent. Now I can hear you saying, no way, baby. I can't do this. I, I can't go a month without conflict. I can't go a month without arguing with somebody, especially my fill in the gap. And so I, I, want, I want to ask you, if you can't go a month, can you go three weeks? Two weeks? What about a week? Can you go a week without arguing and fighting? What about a day? What about one day a week where you intentionally say, in the spirit of Advent, in the spirit of Christmas, I am not going to engage. I'm going to back off and I'm going to discover what it means to bring peace to earth. The spirit of Advent. You know, when I was a kid, there were so many traditions that we did around Advent. You know, my, we had a little Advent calendar that was set up that we, um, and there's these little windows that you open up for every single day that leads you up to Christmas Day. And there were six kids in my family, and so you only got to open up the little window one day a week. And we're so excited for each new window that maybe there's a piece of candy in there. It took us all the way to Christmas Day. We had an Advent wreath set up on the dining room table you know, with the four candles in the middle of it. And every single Sunday, my dad would read a, a passage and one of my siblings would say a prayer. And then another sibling got to light the candle. Another sibling got to light the candle. And it was this magic time. It was this magic time. I, I, for the first, the only time of the year, I wanted to go to church because I wanted to feel the magic of the season. Can you feel the magic of the season? You know, it's these four weeks that we set aside for something beautiful to happen, something marvelous to happen, something mysterious to happen. And we think about today this baby Jesus that was born and the greatest gift, the greatest gift that you can bring to this baby is your divine self. So come to the manger this month and bring your divine self. Amen. Let us pray. God, in the hubbub and chaos and often drama and trauma of the season, God, we know that just as we feel that, so also Mary and Joseph felt that as they came into Bethlehem, as they were rejected from friends and family's houses, as they entered into this cave as a baby was born in the middle of less than ideal circumstances as this baby was wrapped in some sort of swaddling rags and God often in the middle of our lives we feel the same way we look around and wonder how we are going to make ourselves look the part of Christmas, look the part of Advent. Remind us in the middle of, a, of all of this, just as Jesus Christ was this baby who is also the Son of God, that you have made us the same way, that we are divine, that each and every one of us is unique and special and that you have thought about our lives, you have thought about our destinies, that you have put us here to be something, to do something, to change a life, to change the world. God, remind us that you bring peace to this earth through me 
through us. That each and every one of us are instruments of your peace. That in the middle of all of the conflict, in the middle of the arguments, in the middle of the drama and trauma, that you inhabit our hearts, that you dwell in our souls, and inside of us dwells this huge sense of peace and grace and that we just have to let it out and bring peace and grace to other people's lives around us. God, in this season of Advent, we do pray, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. And God, all along, you've been teaching us a prayer. It's a prayer that reminds us that peace does begin with each and every one of us as we extend the hand of forgiveness to all those around us just as you extend it to us. And we lift up that prayer now saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.